Hello, apparently I'm streaming. How are you going, everybody? I'm so glad you could join me for this lunch and learn. And thank you, Louise, for setting everything up and doing all the technical stuff. I really appreciate it. My name's Justin, and I'm in love. Yes, Melissa, you're watching, and I'm in love with you. But I'm also in love with sleep, and I've been in, in, I've been in love with sleep for quite some time. What if I told you that I have access to a product? Let's just imagine I'm Pete Evans, and I'm live streaming on Facebook, um, and I've got this amazing new product, and it's even endorsed by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, um, and it, this product will increase your ability to learn, improve your cognition, your mental abilities, it'll improve your memory, it'll improve your skin, it will help you lose weight, it will improve your, the effectiveness of your exercise, it will help you with emotional regulation and it will also uh, improve your tolerance for distress and even pain. All that stuff in a bottle, one product, you don't need a prescription, it's free. Sleep, or to quote Samuel L. Jackson, go the, to sleep. So I'm hoping to convince you guys today that you need to get another hour of sleep. So in the comments, if you're on the, the, the chat and you, can, um, and you can put some comments in there, uh, I would like you to quickly put in a number. How many hours sleep did you get last night? Please put that in. And now I'm gonna ask you another question. We're all business people here. In, <laughs> oh, you see what you get more sleep. Um, you, uh, I'm gonna ask you another question. In order to do well at your business, in order for your business to thrive, what are the personal characteristics or abilities or capacities that you need? Now, other times when I've done this very talk, people have immediately said 40 hours in a day. Uh, and I know the feeling. So, <laughs> but we can't have 40 hours in a day. We get 24 um, and uh, BSW Connect, they're good, but they can't reorder time and space. So we're still getting 24 hours in a day, no matter how hard release works. <laughs> So, um, so really then it becomes about how do we make the best of those 24 hours? Now, I think in wellbeing, there is a holy trinity and one of the neglected partner is sleep. We talk a lot about diet. Uh, we talk a lot about gym memberships and getting exercise and being the best you can be, but we don't talk anywhere near enough about sleep. In fact, we almost lionize and hero worship people who work really, really hard and then work, you know, sleep for five hours, six at the most, get up, do it all again. You go, wow, what a committed, driven, hard working person with a great work ethic. But what if I told you about another business owner who got nine hours sleep and then got up and with breakfast, had three or four shots of vodka and then took the kids to school and went to business. You wouldn't feel the same way about them. But curiously, in terms of ability to learn, coordination and ability to drive a car, the effects are about the same. And uh, I'm not going to tell you anything about the neuroscience of sleep today that I can't prove, drawing mostly on the work from Matthew Walker's lab from Harvard. So um, this is all very much evidence-based. You haven't got data, you haven't got Jack. So, um, so today I'd like to hopefully convince you that you need to get eight hours sleep. Uh, and that six is not enough. If you think you can cope on six hours sleep, you have just gotten used to a certain level of cognitive impairment and it's hurting your business. If your business can't operate without you sleeping, you know, if it can't operate with you sleeping seven hours a night minimum, your business isn't viable. So, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that. So I'm very passionate about that. I've only got one person showing me how much, how many hours they've had sleeping but uh, I hope that it's at least seven, preferably eight. On average, the recommended number of hours per night is eight hours. And if you exercise, it should be even more. So we've talked enough about exercise because I can sell you a gym membership. I want you to put your barbells down, put your active wear away just for this next 15 minutes. And when it comes to diet, do not activate another almond, not one. Put almonds away your chia smoothies away, put that, you know, eat a pizza for lunch. I don't care. We're talking about sleep. 
this wonderful corner of the wellbeing triad is going to get the attention it deserves. So we're going to talk about, about what sleep does, what it's for, how it helped you, how to get a good night's sleep and what to do if you're not sleeping. That should take us through to um, all the time we have. And I'd like to keep a little, oh, okay, we've got some uh, more commenters. Okay, six hours, need a bit more, mate, uh, you know. Um, so to quote one eminent sleep neurologist, um, the percentage of the population who can cope optimally on six hours sleep a night, rounded off to the nearest percentage, is zero. There is a very, very rare genetic variant of people who can sleep for six hours without cognitive impacts, but they are so rare that you don't have that genetic variant. I'll tell you that right now. You're more likely to be winning a million dollar lottery. So if you're not getting seven hours, you are cognitively impaired right now. You get six hours sleep over a few nights, you might as well be point away. You shouldn't even be driving a motor vehicle. And that has been demonstrated in motor vehicle simulations time and again. In fact, the lack of sleep kills more people on the road than alcohol and drugs combined in Western countries. So this really is a serious health issue. But let's talk about sleep. We tend to think of sleep as just an absence of consciousness. After all, we, we fall asleep, yeah? But it's not actually true. Sleep is really an active state. Now, when I was teaching cognitive psychology at university, we still didn't really understand why we dream. But in the last 10 years, this stuff's really come a long way. We understand a lot more than we used to. Quick and dirty, I could spend four hours on this, but real quick and dirty, let's go to our whiteboard. We go from a wakeful state there, and then we doze off into NREM sleep one, and we would call that dozing. It's that lovely, warm, fuzzy feeling there. And now, sometimes our awareness can get stuck there, so we can go through all of these stages and still think that we haven't been asleep. It's called paradoxical insomnia. So I don't know if you've ever got up and thought, geez, I haven't been asleep yet, I'm gonna be wrecked tomorrow. And then your partner says, uh, you know, um, I had to get up and let the dogs out. And think, I remember that. So you were asleep. Often you're asleep, you don't know. So we're going to talk about how you know if you're getting a good sleep. But then we go to N2. Now, non-REM sleep two is a really important restorative state when your brain starts to generate these wonderful brain activity sleep spindles. So these wonderful spindles that go on if you, if you plug it into EEG. And these spindles help you replenish your ability to learn new things the next day. That's it. They also help you consolidate memories. So things you've learned during the day, they consolidate. Now, if you only get six hours sleep and not eight hours sleep, your ability to remember what you learned the day before is compromised by something like 20%. It's really a big effect. So things you've learned the day before in this N2 sleep, seem to restore your memory centers and your learning abilities and things like this. It's really quick and dirty. Get to N3, that's the deepest level. You're really asleep now. Your body can still move, you can still roll over, but you're hard to wake up. This seems to be restorative of the body. So if you've been doing weights or training really hard, this when the muscles are getting fixed up and things like that. Then we tend to go back up again to N2. Here, yeah, a bit more sleep spindling and memory consolidation, all that good stuff. And then we go to REM, um, one of my favourite bands, but we'll put that aside. Um, rapid eye movement or dream sleep. And this is an incredibly active brain state where your body becomes paralysed, so you don't get up and, you know, and respond to your dream by jumping out the balcony. Um, but your mind is really active. And what we know about that is that REM sleep helps you strip away really strong emotions from the days before, helps you reprocess memories in a way that you can remember them usefully. Um, we tend to find that this activity seems to not go, not work very well in people that have PTSD. And so this is a really, uh, so, so really roughly you could say this is cognitive and memory and learning restoration, bodily restoration, and emotional restoration. Now, here's the kicker. While you go through these, you go through this, this all takes about 90 minutes to have it. And you go through a number of these cycles each night. Isn't that wonderful? And you want to get a few of these in. But the N3, the non-REM sleep, 
there's more of that in the first half of the night, memory consolidation, bodily restoration. And the second half of the night, your REM or your dreaming period gets longer. Have you ever had a chance to sleep in? When you do sleep in for an hour, you dream like buggery. Well, that's because it happens more. So if you're getting up early, it's at four in the morning to exercise or you know, before you're really ready to wake up, you've only had six hours sleep, you might be missing out on 25% of your night's sleep, but you're probably missing about 60% of that emotionally restorative sleep. And believe me, we need to be emotionally stable when we're dealing with customers and worrying about how we're going to pay employees and things like that. So we really need this stuff. Yeah. Um, of course, if you're exercising, you need to sleep in the first half of the night. So if you're going to bed two hours later, you might be missing 20%, 25% of your sleep um, or 20%, depending on how much you're getting, but you might be missing up to 60% of your bodily restorative sleep, meaning that you're not recovered when you do your next workout. And so you're becoming more and more tired of fatigue. So that's something we want to get away from. Okay. So, and again, we go up and down all through the night. And so one of the big myths is that people tend to think that if you remember coming up to non-REM sleep or waking up at night, that you've had a bad sleep. And that isn't true. It's quite natural to wake up. Sometimes you remember it, sometimes you don't. And so that's not a big problem. But time's getting away from us. So I'd like to talk about how to get a good night's sleep. The things you need, question from Mark. What if you are, I've got a question from Mark, what if you're flying and jumping in REM sleep and you feel tired when you wake up? Yeah, some dreams can be a bit tiring. Uh, no two ways about it, especially if they're really emotional. But if you're having a similar dream like flying or jumping in REM sleep, then it's something that emotionally you're trying to figure out. You're, you're trying to work it out. That'd be uh, really interesting. We all have had those times. And also quality of sleep does vary. No matter how right you get this, some nights you just won't sleep and we're going to come to that or you're going to wake up feeling like your sleep has been shite. Uh, and we will come back to that, Mark, so I'd love to hold that thought. But yeah, some dreams can be tiring, can't they? So that means your brain's probably trying to do more emotional work and not doing as much of the other stuff that that can happen. Um, and this is why when we can sleep well, we must not shortchange ourselves. You need eight hours of sleep opportunity. So I'm going to talk about improving your sleep efficiency. Efficiency is a expressed as a percentage of the amount of time you get as opportunity to sleep versus the amount of time that you are sleeping. Um, so you want, you know, so good sleep efficiency if you're around 90 or above 90 percent. So you go to sleep, you're awake for a few minutes, and you're not off to sleep. So one of the things we need for a good night's sleep. Well, okay, one of the things you do need. You do need a cool room. Your body cools right down when you go to sleep, but often our rooms are too warm. So the optimal temperature seems to be about 12 degrees Celsius for a good night's sleep and a light coverlet. Don't get too warm, it will interrupt your sleep or just you know, be deleterious. Um, what you also need is to stay away from caffeine and cigarettes and alcohol. And alcohol is, is a really bad sleep disruptor because you think you go to sleep, but you lose consciousness. But it really, what it does, alcohol, in tests with women who are pregnant, one alcoholic drink will stop a baby from doing any REM processing for 24 hours. Now, a baby spends about 20, 21 hours out of 24 in REM, because that's how the brain is developing and growing and connecting and doing all that stuff. In people, we know that drinking you might be unconscious and you might have some of these other sleep, but you don't drink. And a lot of people I've worked with have been heavy drinkers and they kicked it. So, wow, I'm dreaming like crazy now. And so it, it knocks off certain aspects of your sleep, which is really deleterious to you. Um, caffeine, that's a, a, and the other thing with alcohol too, is it suppresses the activating centers of your brain. So halfway through the night when the alcohol wears off, you, you can wake up, can't go back to sleep feel quite anxious because of that good snapping back rebound effect that you don't want. So if you want to sleep well, no booze, none. Or if you must have a pint, have it for breakfast so it's out of your system. Uh, and then, then you'll be right for the evening. 
Um, I'm not sure how your employer will think about that, but if it's you, it's okay. That's a joy being self-employed, I suppose. Now, caffeine suppresses a chemical in your brain called adenosine. Now, when you woke up this morning, adenosine started building up in your system. And after about being awake for about six, 16 hours, the adenosine starts to exert sleep pressure, and makes you sleepy. Caffeine masks the effect of that adenosine, tricking you into thinking you're not as tired as you are. So uh, anything that knocks that adenosine off is a bad idea. So coffee, one or two in the morning, but take it easy. Um, what about when you sleep really hot, your partner sleeps really cool? Uh, well, my partner and I have different blankets on the bed. I have very few, she has more, and we just, yes. <laughs> so, um, but if somebody's really uh, cold, I just have to wear more blankets because heating up the room is going to mess you both up. So that's, uh, but you know what they say, compromise is the price we must pay for companionship. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I've, got, I've got a comment. Um, I don't have any, and I slept three hours last night, but I don't know what I don't have any means, Ellie, if you could. Yeah, okay. Um, so yes, yeah, we certainly have to compromise on that. Winston Churchill said that he owed the success of him and Clementine's marriage to the fact that they never shared a bedroom. Um, there you go. So what else do we need for good sleep? We need to stay away from nicotine, we need to stay away from adenosine suppressing compounds like caffeine, we need to lay off the booze entirely. Definitely do not drink on more, more nights than you do. Um, really, really important for sleep quality and sleep quality is what helps you learn, rest, play, and stay emotionally stable. And it's more effective at doing that than just about any other compound. Um, so, okay, so this is, uh, this is a really quick and dirty presentation. I could do four hours on all these topics, but we're really running out of time. What else do we need for good sleep? For good sleep, get rid of the gadgets. Get rid of them. So phones, iPads, computers, televisions have no place in a bedroom. Um, and uh, so they're not helpful. It's not just light. In fact, some studies have shown that, that not enough light comes from a mobile phone to actually suppress the production of melatonin, which helps your body get ready for sleep. But it's actually, you're developing an association with doing other things in bed. There's two things you should do in bed, sleep and sex. And that's it. And even the second one shows, in my view, a distinct lack of imagination. So really, it should be about sleep. Now, I'm only saying if, if you're used to reading in bed and you're sleeping really well and waking, feeling rested, well, that's great. Now, sleep trackers can be a problem, though. I don't really like sleep trackers. I prefer people didn't use them. And the reason for this is it tends to produce one paradoxical insomnia. You see all this light sleep and not much REM sleep and assume you didn't have a very good sleep. And in actual fact, you might have had a perfectly fine sleep and that's all the REM your body need if you get it. Um, okay. Oh, Ellie, I see. Um, okay. Um, Ellie, I'll come back to that really quickly. Uh, what I might do, can I hold the questions over until I finish going through this? So people who want to bail off can, and then Anthony and Ellie, I will address myself to your questions. Okay. So we need a nice cool room. We need it nice and dim, particularly stay away from blue light that suppresses melatonin production. We need to do nothing else in bed but sleep and sex. Uh, sleep, um, very difficult to do both at the same time, enjoy it. Um, and we, um, we also um, probably, and I'm just going over that mental list because I'm, I'm trying to get through this pretty quickly. They're the main things. Exercise is wonderful for sleep, but not within three hours of going to bed. And it's not because exercise makes you tired, but the more you stretch your nervous system, the more it can relax. And so if you exercise early in the day, um, I think Emma's taking the piss out of me. And uh, I'll come back. Um, so the more we exercise early in the day, and the other thing is also get out in the light. So your body works on contrasts. So if I stretch myself from cardio earlier in the day, I relax better later. If I get lots of sunlight earlier in the day, if I can, and this is why I think people in lockdown not going outside are really having trouble sleeping because they're not going out and getting sunshine on their skin. So that tells your body, oh, it's daytime. And then when it gets dim later, it goes, oh, it's nighttime. And you start producing melatonin, which prepares your body to sleep. So there's some um, 
I'm going to post some resource, resources under this, and one of them is a sleep hygiene checklist, which covers this in more detail because I've got limited time. But what, what happens when sleep doesn't happen? Okay. Um, oh, just another word about sleep trackers. The other thing you can do is produce sleep anxiety. And so if you're not sleeping, tracking how much you're sleeping or worrying over it usually just increases more anxiety. Now, sleep is like, sleep is a bit like happiness, creativity, and orgasms. If you think about it too much, it goes away. Okay? So you just need to set the scene, and then what happens, happens. But if you're not, sleeping's not coming, this might answer Ellie's question. Um, it can be because you're having trouble switching your brain off, or some people, particularly as we get older, we used to think older people needed less sleep. No, as we get older, we actually reduce our ability to generate sleep. Sleep isn't something you fall into. It's something your body generates, okay? Um, and so I always say with people before going to bed, I've had a question there about you know, difficulties with going to sleep. First of all, Here's some real basic stuff. So we've talked about, I'll put some sleep hygiene up about how to get good sleep, but sometimes it's not going to happen. If it's a really active mind, give your mind something to do, counting backwards from a thousand or listening to an audio book, provided it's not too exciting. The Oxford Compendium of Concrete is always good. Um, the, um, and if your mind is, you know, oh, I've got to remember to do this, got to remember to do that because you are set in small business. So you're doing that. I know you're doing that. Keep a notebook next to your bed so you can put it out of your mind. Write it down and then put it back, okay? Then you can put it out of your mind. Um, but if you're lying in bed and it's not happening and you're getting really irritated, get up, get out of bed, sit somewhere with dim lighting, read a book until you start to feel drowsy again and then go and have another go. Lying there getting distressed and upset is not going to help. Get up, have another go later. If you're lying there and you're warm and comfortable and you're not asleep yet, you don't really give a stuff, then stay there. That's fine. It's no problem at all. You know, so um, so <clears throat> the, other, uh, the other thing with um, difficulty with sleeping is that we tend to clock watch. Don't. Don't have a clock where you can see it. Don't look at your phone. Knowing the time isn't going to help any at all. So get as comfortable as you can. Some people use white noise machines or essential oils. They have no magical properties by themselves, but I say that whatever works for you. I've had another question there. Um, you know, so, so talking about, so let's troubleshoot some sleep, sleep problems real quick. Um, so quick, Anthony, um, there is very limited truth in making up a sleep debt where you can, you know, sleep all weekend and then withdraw during the week. You'll still be cognitively impaired. Regularity is all. There is, and you can catch up on sleep a little bit on the weekend, but you are, you're not preventing a cognitive impairment. So if I sleep all on the weekend a lot and then get six or five hours during the, during the week, I'm impaired. And then when I get to the weekend, I fix that impairment. It's not a case of I get extra sleep on the weekend, therefore I can sleep six hours and not be impaired. No, that's not, that's not how it works. So yes, you can catch up and you can fix that impairment, but it actually takes much longer than a weekend to make up that sleep debt in terms of repairing your cognition, your immune system, and all of that. So um, in that sense, probably no. Um, since I had a question, I don't have any caffeine or alcohol or smoke. Um, well, that's good, excellent. And the idea with sleep is just to give yourself the best chance you can. And if it's anxiety or rumination or worry that's keeping you awake or you have no idea why you're still awake, Appoint with a psychologist who's got some experience in dealing with sleep. And I mean a psychologist because there are neurological issues that can interfere with sleep too. You need somebody who can spot them. And with this COVID stuff and the lockdown, there's been a whole lot of snake oil around wellness coming out of woodwork. It really worries me. Make sure they're a registered psychologist and they've got some experience in dealing with sleep issues. And you should be not afraid to ask about that, okay? But um, so the other thing is get, get up if you can't sleep and wait and do something quiet without screens until you're drowsy. Um, gentle yoga, as long as it's not getting your heart rate really pounding and some meditation before going to bed, Nicola. Nicola. Yep, great idea. And again, if it works for you, fantastic. I tell people, 
Somebody says to me, oh, I can have a double espresso at 10 o'clock and sleep like a baby. I'm like, then go to it. That's fine. But I find when people get into a habit of poor sleep, it's multiple things. And you need to fix all these things to give yourself the best chance of getting a restorative sleep. If it's trouble, um, if you can see somebody about some forms of meditation, mindfulness-based exercises for quieting the mind down, you can't switch your brain off. Don't even try because it's like not thinking about white bears. Ah, you all just thought about white bears. I saw them pop up all over the screen. So you can't suppress your mind. You can only redirect it. So, you know, some mindfulness-based exercises can help, some meditations. Um, yeah, so, uh, Elliot, I'm sorry if you're sleeping so poorly. That's, that's um, something uh, that I'd like to be able to help with, but maybe some of the sleep hygiene stuff too. The other thing for good sleep, routine, routine, routine. That's how you tell your body you're getting ready to sleep. The lights are getting low, you have a shower, um, you, know, you move to a cool room, you're letting your body cool down, you're reading a book, um, and um, then you know, you, uh, your body's saying, oh, we must be about to go to sleep now. Then you get in the bed, you don't do anything else in bed, but sleep, so your body goes, okay, you must be getting the time. Um, I've had a question here about middle insomnia, where if you, know, if you get up during the night because you've got to go to the toilet or something, it's hard to go back to sleep. Again, uh, you can see some, some exercises there, but if you're lying in bed and you're generally comfortable not getting stressed, then lie there and enjoy the warm. That's fine. Um, maybe cut back on the fluids just before bedtime, lay off that last cup of tea, and you may you know, need to get up for a leak a bit less often. Some people do find that quite disruptive. The alternative is not very pleasant though, and your partner will get really cranky with you, so on wet bed. If you can avoid it, um, okay. So here's the main thing. Stressing about sleep doesn't help, but giving yourself every opportunity to get a good night's sleep will improve your cognition. It'll improve your ability to deal with the unexpected during the business day. Um, okay, yes, we're a bit over time. And so um, I am going to post some resources, a couple of videos I did for, for a high school I used to work to um, that will reiterate a lot of this stuff. Um, one on how to get good sleep, another one on what to do when sleep doesn't come, and also a checklist on sleep hygiene. And sleep hygiene is just setting the scene to give your body the best opportunity to get a good night's sleep. So what I'd like you to do is give yourself another hour's sleep opportunity tonight. If you don't sleep, don't worry. You may be in a situation where you need to teach your body to sleep a bit more. It does take a little while, but you will feel better for it. And uh, I hope you give it a go. And if you're really stuck and not sleeping well, make an appointment with a psychologist and get some evidence-based advice on how to change it. And you will be able to, okay? Uh, I'm gonna answer any more questions if people wanna hang around for about another 10 minutes. But otherwise, thank you so much for coming to this very quick and dirty talk and joining me for your lunch. And um, I uh, wish you a very good night's sleep tonight because it's the best thing that you can do for your business. See you next time. All right, anybody have any questions? Uh, did I miss any? Um, okay. Noise machines and essential oils. Um, whatever works for you. Essential oils have no magical properties by themselves, but smell is the only sense that goes straight to your emotional center. So if there's a particular smell like lavender or primrose that makes you feel really good, then use it. Yeah, by all means. So, yeah. Um, okay. Um, right. And so do pop back to the Facebook site or the BSW Connect site, because I will post some resources so you can recap on all this stuff as well. Um, but I'm really passionate about getting sleep. So yes, put away those activated almonds, put down that dumbbell, get some sleep. And of course, sleep gets neglected because I can sell you a gym membership. I can sell you a pulsating light. Pete Evans, um, an activating machine. But sleep's bad for business, but it's good for your business. Yeah, that's the main thing. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, I think I've covered most of the questions there, which is terrific, I think. Yep, there, yeah, Anthony, don't, yeah, don't bank on not being um, able to deposit sleep. Um, targeting on average eight hours. Some people do okay seven and a half. 
but it is a case of um, eight hours sleep. Ah, Anthony, yes, got the second half there. Um, eight hours of sleep opportunity. So bed at 10 if you're going to be up at six, that sort of thing. And then you're working on just improving your sleep efficiency. Bugger the sleep tracker off. The only thing you need to know is, do I feel rested when I wake up? So I noticed that seven hours sleep is not enough for me. I can do okay on seven and a half or eight hours of sleep opportunity. But um, especially if you're training hard, you're not going to do any good on less than that. Um, there, there, was some, um, there was a belief until very recently that some people cope they can six hours. But we... Um, <laughs> Uh, Emma, yeah, we'll talk later, young lady. You're in trouble. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, we know from the neurological and cognitive evidence now that that's just not the case. People don't cope in six hours. They just get used to being impaired. And being cognitively impaired, that's something we can ill afford when we're working for ourselves. Um, Emma, no, I don't want a light machine. Thank you very much. I have one. It's called the sun. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, let's um, wrap it up. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. And go to sleep.